See, we just jumped off track and now we're a science yes, show. Today. I know we're, we are. See, we didn't plan on this. This is the one. All right. Welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. Here's your host, Scott Cowan. Well, Lindsay, after uh, many false starts, <laughs> here you are on our episode in this time recording at 9 a.m. on a Tuesday morning. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about your backstory? Well, Scott, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. And uh, hello to everyone out watching this. Uh, I'm Lindsay Lawrence, owner of Metamorphic Gear. We're an upcycled bag and accessories manufacturer here in Seattle, Washington. And um, I uh, started the company 10 years ago, as I said, but it, as you know, everything kind of starts before the actual hitting the road with the proverbial wheels. Uh, I have a degree in resource management uh, from the program on the environment at the University of Washington. So I'm a UW grad and um, I actually, kind of tie it back to when I lived in Brazil. So I lived in Brazil in 95 and 96, working with street kids down in Curitiba, Brazil. And I was always really impressed by the utility that people find in items that usually in the US or in kind of European style countries, we just dispose of things that are not being used in their first intended life cycle. And so a lot of the kids would come with backpacks and, you know, bags for their school books made out of rice bags and bean bags and flour sacks, you know, whatever they could have. And their parents were sewing these up for them, obviously. And I was just really impressed by, you know, how they were making these pretty functional objects for what they were needing out of material that would normally have been thrown away. And so when I came back to the US, I got my uh, degree in marine carpentry and boat building, worked in the marine industry for many years, and then also then went back to school at the University of Washington a little later, not in life really, but just in my 20s. And kind of these two areas of interest came in with the um, marine industry, and I was always an outdoor person, so I was a climber. And I was at a, an event, and I saw a number of sails being thrown away into the disposal, and I grabbed them, kind of realizing, hey, they have a lot of cloth. And I started making my first bags out of those for myself. And I had family members and friends start wanting them. And it kind of just snowballed out of there. And then in 2008 and nine, with the recession really hitting hard, I was laid off from the company I was uh, with at that point. And uh, I started kind of really with some earnest working in making the product. And in 2011, uh, I started the company with two products. And now we have about 13 different products and we manufacture everything in Seattle. Uh, we, as much as possible, source all of our uh, findings, which are all the items that go into the bags with the D-rings and the webbing and all the things that are needed for that, the zippers and stuff, which is hard in the U.S. because we've outsourced a lot of that. But mm -hmm. uh, we really do try to make sure that most of the product is made locally if not in North America. Okay. So when you started, you started with two products. What were those first two products? And do you still have those today? I do not still have those products. We started with a kind of a messenger style bag. Uh, the market for messenger bags is quite diverse and quite flooded with a lot of options for customers. And so we ended up uh, quickly deciding that we would move in a different direction. Uh, we also made these little kind of uh, pencil pouches, which was a smaller product, but we found that, again, that was a pretty diverse uh, product line with regards to other competitors within the market at a very 
uh, inexpensive price. So we were competing with foreign made uh, products or virgin material products also, which uh, makes it much less expensive on the front end. Uh, so we learned quickly or I learned quickly at that point and uh, started creating kind of more of the products that we have on our website, uh, the boat totes, the travel totes, um, duffel bags, the toiletry kit, dop kits is what we call them, uh, wallets and dog leashes and other material products like that. Yeah, I'm actually looking at the dog leashes right now. So yes. I've got a lot of questions. I'll try to, I'm going to try to keep this one going down some path, but as I warned you <laughs> before, you know, not going to probably happen. It's all right. But first off, how did you pick the name metamorphic? How'd you come about? How'd that come about? Cause that's an interesting name. Well, I wanted something that denoted, uh, something moving from its first phase. So like if you think of the metamorphosis of, let's say a butterfly, it is an egg, then it turns into a caterpillar, and then it goes into the chrysalis. And then it's the same creature, literally, but it's just changed its form from its original form, which was the caterpillar. So that's a metamorphosis. Metamorphic more refers to rocks. And so... Um, I was a rock climber and enjoyed climbing mountains, not as much rock climbing, but I enjoyed the adventure of all of that. And, you know, marble, which is a beautiful rock, actually started as a sedimentary rock in the ocean from millions or billions and billions of little shells, uh, calcium shells that get layered and then compressed and then you know, millions and billions of years later, here's this beautiful rock that we're, you know, carving David out of and, you know, just making these amazing things. But if you actually looked at it, it's really not that remarkable a thing when it started out. And so uh, I really liked the idea of it kind of moving from one thing, but not really changing in a lot of ways, like, you know, glass, you have to melt down and then it has to kind of be, there's a lot of energy that has to be put into that for that change to occur. So. See, we just jumped off track and now we're a science yes, show. Today. I know we're, we are. See, we didn't plan on this. This is the one. All right. So you've got this great name because I think it's an awesome name. Thank you. And then you use another word that I'd like you to provide some clarity to. Yeah. And that's upcycling. Yeah. Can you explain uh, for me? Here's. For me as a layman, what is the difference between upcycling and recycling? Yeah, it's a, a, a word that I think is thrown around quite a bit, Scott. So I appreciate you asking because recycling is, uh, so we're very familiar with like, we take a can, a, a beer can or a soda pop can and we crush it and then we throw it into our recycle bin and that can then needs to go and actually get sorted and then gets into the supply chain of a company that actually takes it and melts that can back down into aluminum. There's quite a few processes in the recycling of aluminum, which I won't go into, but that, for, our, for our science episode, <laughs> for our science episode, tune in for that next one. Um, but anyways, it's a pretty dirty process, a lot of energy, I, mm -hmm. you know, and there's a lot of material that is actually waste from that because it's, you know, it has the labels and all of the food and everything, but you get a lot of aluminum out of it. And then they have to, you know, press it again to make it into the cans. So mm -hmm. you can keep aluminum, you know, it's a very easily recyclable product. Okay. But upcycling is where you take the material in its original form. So like for us, we take an old sail and we don't need to shred it and then make new material out of it. We're actually taking it at its original form, which is a sheet good woven material. And then we cut it up, clean it, and then it goes into our bags as 
originally sale material. So we can actually say that it actually, its form is original, its function has changed. And okay. so you want to look at upcycling as kind of a, a movement of a material in its original form into a new function is okay. how I like to look at it. Well, so that opens up lots of questions. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, sourcing being one of those, it, it, that must be from a supply chain. How are you, how are you guys able to continue to source quality materials to use for your products? And you're laughing. Yeah. So maybe, maybe I'm asking a tough question, but um, I, I was just going to show you the gray hair here. <laughs> You're really only 18. <laughs> I'm really only 18. Yes. So am I. Yes, exactly. You look beautiful at 418. That's great. Yeah. yeah nice. Yeah. Um, so, no, it's yeah, a, what it's is a the... trick. And, okay. um, you know, there's two areas for upcycling. One is direct from consumer upcycling. So, um, Alchemy Goods is a competitor of ours, but they make, uh, bags out of old inner tubes from bikes, and they make a bunch of bag products out of that. But they are a direct con to consumer because they need the bike owner of the bike tube that popped or got punctured to bring in that bike tube and drop it off at a bike shop and have it repurposed or upcycled. Um, okay. We generally work about 97% of all of our material comes directly from industry partners. So we try to go to what are called point source manufacturers of this material where they're actually producing in large volumes this product that we're needing for our supply chain to keep going. Um, not that it doesn't exist out in the general public, but it's a much harder uh, find to go to, you know, Bob, who is getting rid of his dry bag from his kayak after owning it for 15 years. And that's a much harder find than going mm -hmm. to a manufacturer that's producing, you know, 5,000 pounds of material annually and disposing of that. And for us, it's an easier ask. We go in and say, hey, we will be your uh, essential disposal agency or disposal company for mm -hmm. this material and only this material. And we set up processes within their manufacturing to actually gather that material before it goes into the dumpster essentially. And so okay. we set up, you know, uh, bins in their manufacturing, uh, and relationships with them before, and then they get to see the bottom line where their cost saving partnering with us is actually quite significant fairly quickly because then they're not loading up that, um, the waste system for themselves and then having to pay for disposal of that quite as much. So this is where we start going squirrel yeah. I'm on your website and I'm looking at your, well, my camera, yeah, I am looking at, hang on the red and blue large dop kit. Yeah. And so I have two words. I have okay, one. You've got one. I have one here. Okay. This is the Perfect. medium dop kit. And okay. so I have two, two questions. First off, it says more than 95% of the upcycled materials are from tarpaulin body. Yep. First off, what's a tarpaulin body? Tarpaulin is a vinyl material from, it's kind of a catch-all phrase for any kind of plastic embedded uh, woven material. And you can kind of see the little bumps that. it has. Mm -hmm. And that is actually a woven material that then is embedded with this plastic outside. And you'll see it on the trucking industry. The marine industry uses it. Okay. If you've ever watched The Deadliest Catch, a lot of the uh, arms or the cranes that they're using and all the winches and heavy-duty machinery that are on deck, they're actually covering it with this very similar material. Okay. Um, and so... They use it in a whole variety of uh, 
industries in the Northwest specifically. Okay. And then, so one of the things that you didn't really say about your backstory that's on the website is that you were a boating enthusiast and yes. professional professional. So <laughs> racing sail handles, what yeah. are those? And for you, you're like, well, they're obviously these things, Scott, but, um, what are they? And <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> this is the, please. this is the sail material here on the handle of this okay. little toiletry kit. And, um, it's the, so this is a carbon fiber, and Kevlar, which is the same material that they use for bulletproof vests. Right. And then they laminate it between this kind of clear material, and you can kind of see that it's semi-transparent. Translucent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so essentially, if you can imagine a large sail that's almost the size of a living room almost, or a large right. truck, um, Essentially, that material has a life expectancy and starts to deform uh, over one or two seasons, and then it gets thrown away, and then they have to get a new one. And so we collect that material and strip it. So we have like two and a half inch strips that get pulled out of that sail, and then we're able to lap it over and sew it. And then we make our handles. So if this piece here that you're seeing, this is actually three layers of the same material that starts out probably at about two and a half inches. And then the, so it's a racing sails, the technical term for it. And it's just a okay. very kind of cool looking pattern to it with that kind of black carbon fiber and then uh -huh. the... Uh, Kevlar embedded in that mylar. The mylar is that clear sheathing over the top. Okay, so I have to I have to explain myself now, so that for somebody who's listening to this, going, he doesn't know what a racing sail is. I read it as racing sail handles, thinking that that was a, a handle, not a racing sail. Well, that, <laughs> thank you for yes, thank you for clarifying. Yeah, yes. <laughs> So those are those are actual sails then that were used in in on a sailboat racing. Yeah. You're taking them, you're you're stripping them down into smaller pieces, repurposing them as the handles. As the All handles, right. and um, you know, it's uh, you're bringing up a great point of like how do you best explain where all of these different material streams are coming in, and you know, technically the sail is called a high performance sail and we try to have it be a little bit more easily approached by our um, uh, community and the understanding of it. Oh, it's a sail for racing. Um, and it is a difficult thing to kind of explain where each of these pieces or parts come from within an industry. So, um, so the white material here on this bag is what we typically see as a sail material. The racing sail is a more high performance, but doesn't have a very long life. This is maybe one to two racing seasons. This is probably anywhere from five to 12 years of sailing with this okay. Dacron material. So it's just, and then this is the vinyl tarpaulin material that again, okay we utilize so and so the the handles on there are let's let's talk about those yeah these are the old climbing rope and we work with a lot of the indoor climbing gyms in the area we okay. work with um recology also which is a part of uh waste management services and we work with rei and a couple other organizations to collect the rope that's coming into them uh, that usually just gets thrown out. They have to cut it up to dispose of it because of liability issues, mm -hmm. but we're able to, you know, encapsulate that liability by signing lots of documents and lawyers and stuff <laughs> like that. But we can assure them that the rope is being destroyed because it's under a certain length as we right. cut it up. And so it's still functionally a climbing rope. It's still very strong material, uh, but uh, you wouldn't want to climb on a 14-inch long piece of climbing rope. So essentially they deem it as 
no longer a climbing aid. And so then we're using that material in our dog leashes and the handles on our totes. Right. I was just going to say uh, you, the largest dog isn't going to strain one of these things. I mean, no, uh, no. You're looking at something that can withstand, you know, in excess of, you know, I think around a thousand pounds of pressure, because if you think of someone falling at that right. near terminal velocity, by the time the rope catches them, mm. uh, they're, you know, rated at a very high level. Um, and so that's another way in which we get rope two from individuals. It's one of the only materials that we get in large amounts from individual climbers that have used it for a number of years, fallen on it a few times, don't trust it any longer, and then donate it to us. I'm on, I'm on the, the dog, um, leash page right now. And you've yeah. got, you know, at this time you've got brown and pink cross, blue, terracotta, lime green. You've got multiple colors here. Yeah not being a climber are these different do the different colors signify a, a like a rating as you know a, a it can sustain us you know or is it just are these colors just decorative they're more decorative the more simple or kind of the solid color uh product a lot of that comes from the climbing gym industry mm -hmm. uh they're going through thousands of feet of product a year and they're buying it in thousand foot rolls or more. And so they purchase it and cut it up to, you know, be able to use on certain areas in their gym. And okay. uh, so we generally get that, but it really, it, changes all the time and some people like the really bright colors for ice climbing because it stands out on the snow so when you're climbing mount rainier you want a really bright color and not something that's white and kind of crossed over because you don't want to step on your rope with your crampons which are the mm -hmm. spiky parts on the boot of a, a mountain climber and ice climber so they usually want something really bright um, and so I'm going to, so one question about all your products is because you are at the whim of your suppliers, yes. if you will. Yes. What I see on your, your website today available, let's just say the terracotta dog leash, Yep. Might not be available six months from now because yep. that source has moved on to a different color. Exactly. Okay. It's, um, it's both our strength and a weakness for us because it's not something that a buyer, a wholesale buyer, or someone that sees their friend with the particular dog leash walking their dog, and then they go onto our website, and I get a number of emails a week like, hey, I saw this bag, or I saw this particular dog leash. I don't see it on your website anymore. And that right. is a major aspect of kind of the uniqueness of each of the pieces that are on our website. And so like the terracotta that you're referring to, I was just looking at it yesterday because we shipped some out. We only have, I think, four or five left. And I don't have any more of that material in, the, in our supply chain. I have more rope <laughs> right. but not terracotta color not but. terracotta color mm -hmm. and so um it definitely uh is a complicating factor in the manufacturing for us because uh we end up having to take quite a lot of photography because when <laughs> we bring in a new product which isn't new to us in the sense of that it's not a dog leash at six feet long with a particular you know clip but it's new to us because it's a totally different color. And so our website often, uh, we try to keep product that we can have in larger volume. A lot of the very unique pieces go out to our wholesale accounts, to our stores, so that people really feel like when they find something at a storefront of ours, uh, that there you know, maybe only two or three of those in existence 
you know, uh, only because of how unique the color combinations are. And you're, you're hitting on a really interesting aspect of the upcycling part of repurposing these. I, I agree. I can see that it is a double-edged sword. Like you said, you're going to have to take a bunch of photography. And uh, because if you're out of the camo bag with the pink strap, then it's gone. It's but gone. at the same time, if you're buying something, I don't want to say it's unique, but you're buying something with, a, with some exclusivity to it that you're not right. going to find... Um, the Nike shoes that I'm wearing are not the same as the Nike shoes that you're wearing and right. the other 3000 people that just bought That's them. Right. They're made in bulk. And I think color is a, an interesting, especially around bags and accessories. Uh, people are generally more forgiving with bright colors. We like to have something that kind of pops and stands out and people love the process of discovery too, when you're shopping, you love to find something mm -hmm. that, you know, no one other person is probably going to have that exact product. And so we find that, that we tilt our advertising in that direction around talking about the exclusivity or the uniqueness mm -hmm. of that one piece, not that the form and funct function is any different, but the function of each bag is exactly the same, but mm -hmm. the color combination is going to be what is the unique aspect of that. So I'm on your Instagram and Instagram's given me some problems when I'm on my computer. Ah, so I'm going to ask you to describe a photograph that's been there for a little while. Like, so there's this photograph of somebody at the beach. They have like a green bag hanging next to them and you see the the in the 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 um the side of the bag the narrow side of the bag and the rope is like twisted as it goes from the bottom of the bag up yeah that just caught my eye and um, that that's our purse can you explain that yeah that's okay, our purse. purse okay and uh is this the one you're talking that's about the one. that yeah. is it yeah so um it's it has okay. kind of dual properties. The twist is just a unique kind of interesting part okay. of the product, but the rope is a single length of rope that can transform the purse from over the shoulder or cross body. So okay. you can let go of one side of the over the shoulder two parts to a single length that goes and can lengthen out. So it's essentially oh. the anchor to the bag and the rest of it just feeds through some grommets. Um, okay. And, see that yeah. caught my, that caught my eye. Now I'm on, now I found it on the website, so I'm looking yep. at it and yeah. what, that's a very cool function. Who, how'd you come up with that design? Well, um, you know, that's another really interesting aspect of upcycling that we were touching on, you know, a lot of designers, when you're designing a bag or a purse or a functional item, will design what they want and then find the materials that best fit into the form and the function that they're looking for to fulfill on. And we okay. have to come at it from the other side. We have the material, and then we are needing to find bags and the designs that will fit into the materials that we can produce essentially. And so, you know, we try to not have, you know, eight or 10 handles on products because, you know, we really only have a couple different sizes of the rope material that we can utilize and we want to utilize as much rope as possible. So we were trying to come up with a purse that would utilize a single length of rope that can also coincidentally be utilized in our dog leashes because we don't mm -hmm. want to have to cut different length rope for all of our different products. And so the dog leash length of rope is identical to the length rope that goes into our purse, for instance. Okay. And so we just have to kind of fulfill on a number of functions for those products. Uh, and 
So it's just a kind of a chicken and egg issue, right? <laughs> so, so actually these might be a little bit more complex to build or to design than if you were given just unlimited materials right. to work with. Yes. Okay. And Fair. okay. But we're still utilizing those repurposed materials. And when at all possible, we're also trying to produce products that are manufactured out of our scrap even. So like our wallets are utilizing the little end clippings of some of our larger products. And we were trying to produce something out of our scrap material uh, that utilized little pieces that had already been washed have already gone through the process of cleaning. And then we're now reducing one more step of material waste going out the door for us too. Okay. So cleaning, washing. So yeah. why don't you walk, walk us through, you get a delivery of, of this a product, you know, you can pick the product you get. a. So first off, I guess it's coming in by truck, right? You're getting a truckload of this stuff. If in a perfect, yeah. Okay. Yeah. What happens it when it tonnage. arrives at the warehouse? So uh, when it comes to us from our warehouse, we're bringing it in. Uh, we sort it. Uh, we evaluate if it's a material that we're needing right away or if it's something that needs to be warehoused for future. Uh, that hits on one of the issues that we were talking about earlier around our supply chain and how to work with our supply chain. So we actually have to be out ahead of our product need for manufacturing. So we're anywhere from four to six months out ahead of ourselves in our production knowledge of what we're going to be producing. So right okay. now we're looking at what we're going to be actually producing for the holidays um, out of just pure necessity of needing to know uh, next month we'll be producing or starting to cut product that will be going into our holiday manufacturing because this, we need to be that far out ahead of production to be able to have it streamlined. And so the difficulty comes into just needing to always be bringing in new suppliers if we're outstripping our production needs. And mm -hmm. so we're looking at that when the product comes in, we categorize it into the colors that are being given to us because, again, you touched on it earlier, like it's almost Christmas every day for us or a holiday because, you know, it's like, oh, my gosh, we're out of purple and here's purple or we're out of red and here's red or, you know, like <laughs> the products that we're needing so we can fill in kind of we have that color and that'll immediately go into production or it'll get put onto the shelf and held and we'll know roughly how much we have in stock to be able to pull from. And okay. uh, it's a constant, you know, sliding scale. So how do you, how are you cleaning the material? So or there's two. So like for the sale material, we get vast majority is used material that mm -hmm. has is that white Dacron material and we clean it in a multi-step process. We cut it first. So we're not cleaning the wholesale. Okay. Uh, and then we cut it into the material sizes that we need it in. And then it goes into literally a, a large bath with a pretty over the counter detergent. We use, uh, OxyClean. This episode is brought to you by OxyClean. OxyClean. Sorry, could, you're, couldn't relate. You're welcome, <laughs> OxyClean. Another, <laughs> another cleaning for your product. But okay. it's kind of an industry. It's uh, really very environmentally friendly. It doesn't have a lot of dyes to it, mm -hmm. you know, and it does a spectacular job on the Dacron. And it sits in that bath for anywhere from 12 to 48 hours and it gets scrubbed and worked on if it's really dirty. Most times it's not super dirty. People usually take care of their sales pretty well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but then it gets then cleaned and dried and 
and then put into our inventory for production of that particular product. Um, and so the sale is generally less dirty than let's say the truck tarpaulin that comes off the semi tractor trailer that has nice. nearly a million miles of road grime on it. <laughs> and so that material gets evaluated, cut up and goes through a multi-step process of getting sprayed with a high pressure uh, water jet, warm water, and then goes into a multi-step uh, kind of degreaser cleaner and then goes into the final step of being washed in another OxyClean bath. Um, and the degreaser that we use is actually uh, a product that is uh, utilizing uh, the citrus industry's scrap citrus, and mm -hmm. it's a denatured citrus oil, essentially, uh, from a company down in New Mexico uh, owned by... Um, I think it's a first na or a Native American and minority owned company down there. It's a large company that does a lot of industrial cleaners for the hospital industry. And okay. we found that it works extremely well on the vinyl material. So you guys really, I mean, even, even with the cleaning process, you're, you're conscious about the products that you're using and the impact that they're going to have. It okay. was really a critical component. We really didn't want to take on materials that, you know, were one dangerous to work with and two weren't easily cleaned in a environmentally friendly way. Uh, right. We really decided, and you know, we're evaluating new materials all the t time too, Scott. So it's not a static product. So, you know, it's, constantly being looked at and we have new suppliers that we're trying to bring on but you have to bring them on before you bring a new product on too so we have kind of a i have a large book of materials and the suppliers and when we go into kind of the design phase of a new product we open up this book and we start looking at all of these materials that we could actually possibly use in that design uh, again, it's front loading that design process with these materials in mind. This is, this is very interesting. Um, this is, you know, another little diagram that I love to kind of show, you know, we try to be kind of this triple bottom line company and, you know, working on the environmental aspect and the societal and economic aspect uh, mm -hmm. We're touching on all three of these areas and, you know, segueing into that with the environmental impact of our cleaners, let's just say, and also taking material out of the waste stream. We're having a large impact on that. But you also can think of it as if you buy a bag from Metamorphic Gear, you're probably not going to buy a brand new bag to fulfill that need. So you're having multiple layers of impact environmentally. Societally, mm -hmm. we manufacture everything in Seattle. So societally, we're putting back the manufacturing hyper-locally. And so we are paying livable wages. We have local uh, manufacturer, which is us. So my mm -hmm. sewers are here locally in uh, downtown Seattle. And so we're keeping it really close to home. So you know that that money that's going to them is probably going to their home and, you know, whatever it's expenses. spending the money in the community. Community. And uh, we do all of our banking through BECU. And so we try to really have a hyper-local focus on our economic impact. And then the societal impact is also that kind of multi-tiered aspect of hiring locally, trying to focus on uh, economic impacts that are, you know, local to Washington, but also local to the U.S. We try to buy our zippers that are made down in California. Uh, we, you know, buy our labels, these little labels here, they're mm -hmm. made in Mexico. Uh, so, you know, but 
there's no longer a manufacturer that does that here in the U S um, very, very often. So it's like, how do you kind of bring all of those parts together? <laughs> right. Right. Let's transition because there's a couple other things I want to make sure we get to in, in this episode, but let's talk about your companies. You have this tab on your website about giving back. Yeah. That's obviously important to you. Very. Why don't you elaborate on what you're doing there? Because I'm not going to do a good job of that. So you, <laughs> you, you tell that story. <laughs> so uh, we donate both product to nonprofit organizations for their whatever it would be. If it's a giveaway to their organization's biggest donors or to uh, sell at an auction, uh, we donate quite a bit of product to different organizations in the Northwest. Um, we also donate 1% of our uh, retail sales to various nonprofit organizations in the area. Right now, we've been working with uh, Puget Sound Keepers Alliance. Uh, we donate uh, directly to them the cash that we allocate from our retail sales. And we try to you know, give them this infusion of money that comes from our product sale and it mm -hmm. also, uh, you know, helps us be able to talk a little bit about what they're doing in the environment around. They do a lot of clean water advocation around, you know, beach cleanups, uh, issues that are occurring, which are very prevalent right now around the issues of orcas and the salmon uh, fishing and, you know, success of salmon in the Northwest um, mm -hmm. and so we could talk about that, but we always find that, you know, working with an organization that that's all that they do gives us the ability to support them in what they're doing. Right. And that touches on that societal impact that, uh, I was showing you on that diagram. All right. So let's talk about you personally. So when you're not running this company... I, I know that you have uh, uh, some kids that are in school, so you got school age kids. So you you've got plenty of quiet, peace, tranquility in your life. But, <laughs> I um, do now. They're finally yeah. back in school after <laughs> being a year and a half, almost of or a year, a solid yeah, year, year of uh, being yeah. teacher, <laughs> CEO. Uh, <laughs> so what do you do? What do you guys do? What do you do? What does the family do? What do you guys like to do around Washington for recreation and fun? Oh, there's no end, Scott. I mean, okay. you know, you know how I know this is a loaded question. I mean, the really fun thing that we've started doing. So my sons are, so my oldest is 11. My youngest is seven. Uh, we've been really getting into skiing, downhill skiing, uh, okay. lately, and it's been an activity that has still kind of gone on even with COVID with a lot of reductions. So we've been going to Crystal, uh, they've been taking classes through Mini Mountain, which is a, a local ski school, um, hmm. up at Snoqualmie. Uh, we've been doing hikes. I love doing snowshoeing. So, uh, and I, so, so where's a, where's a, let me interrupt you. Let me, I, yeah. two questions. Number one is more of a tongue in cheek comment. Yes. You've got your kids on skis and they're not snowboarding. Cause it seems like every kid wants to snowboard. <laughs> so I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a skier. Okay. And, uh, I, I said, if they want to do the snowboarding more power to them, but I would love for them to learn how to ski and snowboard okay. so that they could choose either one or the other. And oh. I, I have snowboarded and enjoy it, but now that I'm a little older and a little bit more crotchety, I, <laughs> I'm going back to my true beginning, which was skiing back in the seventies was how I learned. And it's right. ingrained in my 
deep part of my brain, so I can't really go anywhere else other I, I than that. I was going to say, because so. it seems like every kid, <laughs> they just they, they all want to snowboard. So when you said they were skiing, I was like, wow. All right, so yes. the second question so, is, you mentioned snowboarding. Yeah. Where is a, give us a couple of places that you think are great places to go snowboarding in Washington. Well, uh, so... We were just, my boys do love the terrain parks. And so Mm -hmm. uh, Snoqualmie Central has a couple amazing snow parks. Uh, During our winter break, we went down, uh, I know it's not Washington, but we went down to Mount Bachelor in Mm -hmm. Oregon. And they have amazing terrain parks and half pipes and things I won't even try to go into, but I love watching my kids do it because they are resilient at a level I'm not anymore. Those bones heal quickly. They bounce. <laughs> I don't yeah, bounce I anymore. I don't bounce anymore. <laughs> my, in fact, my hip hurts just having this conversation. Just even thinking about it, I'm yeah. aching. Um, yeah. Anyways, so uh, yeah, they, they love that kind of thing. And uh, we're... And then also at uh, we've gone down to Crystal Mountain, and Crystal has just absolutely gorgeous uh, terrain park, and then also just the skiing is spectacular. And uh, it took a little forethought because in Crystal at the beginning of the year you were having to make reservations for parking. They've opened mm-hmm. that up now for the spring season, and I think we're heading down there this coming weekend actually. Okay. So, so besides winter activities, how about summer? Do you guys sail still? Are you still active sailing? We do. uh, We've done, I have a friend that still owns a sailboat. And so we do sailing out of Edmonds. Um, My in-laws own a motorboat. And so we do a lot of boating out in the Puget Sound and they've essentially retired on the boat. So they go up into the, uh, all around the Puget Sound, and then we'll meet them occasionally during the summer vacation. And then, well, it sounds like you've got it dialed in because you know the the adage of a boat is, you oh, know, yeah. uh, you know, so you've got people that have the boat have and the who boat. can use it. I, I that's love it. right. We yes, we won't tell them that, but you know, that's good on you. Oh. I, you know, it's, it's a good adage. You know, it's yeah. uh, it's. I'm I'm very happy to help out on the boat and do a, a I'm very helpful on the boat, but right. I'm also at the ha- end of the day, you can hand the boat I, back to them though. So <laughs> so that, Scott, it's so that, you know, it's like, and that was nice. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, they had a great time. <laughs> um, yeah. but it's great. It's, you know, the Northwest, we have fantastic summers. I love hiking with, uh, the family. We love going up into like, Snow Lake is a very well traveled one up uh, on uh, I ninety. We like going up into um, Salmon La Sac, which uh, has just spectacular hiking out of Salmon La Sac area. We generally also have anywhere from about five to seven days. We go over to Lake Wenatchee with some friends. And uh, we car camp or camp at one mm-hmm. of the camping sites That's there. Beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. And uh, it, the nice thing about that also is that it can be, you know, summer here in the Northwest, you know, can, you know, be rainy on the West side and gorgeous on the East side, which is spectacular. So Lake Chelan is awesome. Mm-hmm. Um and then going up into the Methow Valley and just uh, there's no end to the amazing adventures you can have here, but that yeah. we try to do uh, quite a bit of the hiking. And well, that's great. That yeah. you're getting, it's great that you're getting the kids out and, and letting them see, see these places. Cause yeah. are, you've just named some very beautiful places that are probably within at most, maybe three hours of where you live. Exactly. And, uh, and we really at try most. to at most, and we try to keep it to that hour to two hour maximum drive time only because it starts getting a little squirrely in the car with our boys. Well, I joke then you're going from Seattle to Edmonds then in that period. Of yeah, right. <laughs> Sorry. 
Occasionally, <laughs> that can be true. Yes. Yes. But, yeah. Uh, no. Yeah, hopefully not. I, hopefully not. I kid, but no. You're. So, are you? Uh, so, I ask this question frequently. Are you? A, are you a coffee drinker? As he holds up a coffee cup. Great. And uh, uh, Otters Elementary. Okay. So yes. I don't know if you're drinking their the elementary school's brand. No, I'm not. But, uh, but okay. I, so if you're going for coffee in, in, in the area, where do you like to go for coffee? And what drink I'm, do you typically get? Oh, I'm, I'm a little bit of a stickler when it comes to coffee. So I'm glad that you asked because I do have opinions on that. Um, okay. Let's hear them. So I am a French press connoisseur. Okay. I love a little bit of milk just to cut the acidity down. Um, okay. I am loyal to a fault to Seattle Coffee Works, which is a okay. local coffee brewer, uh, single source coffee uh, purveyor. Mm -hmm. And they have a couple great uh, coffee stores also in the area, Ballard yeah. downtown, and, mm -hmm. uh, they also ship. So I love ordering their, uh, freshly roasted. So when you're ordering what, what, so where are you at on the profile? Are you a, a darker roast fan darker. or a lighter roast? I love the darker roast, not quite okay. the espresso dark French roast, but what? that's, that's where it's at. Come on. <laughs> I will have that, but it, I end up only needing one. <laughs> There's no more caffeine in that than there is in the lighter roast. No, it's all in it, our it, head. It's, it's how it impacts heads. the stomach for me. Oh, okay. So, okay, fair enough. I'll give you that. <laughs> I'll give you that. Yes, the, the caffeine aspect is definitely, but I love having at least two cups a day in the morning and two to three cups and okay. larger volume. Uh, and so, so if you're out and around, not it, so when you go out to your local coffee shop and you're going to grab a cup of coffee when you're going somewhere, yes. Where would you stop? Uh, I love stopping on Lake City. There's uh, a coffee bakery called Coffee Clutch. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. They're a German style bakery. Uh, I am loyal to them, I love their coffees. Um, and then, yeah, it's, you know, it, I whatever, love asking this question about whatever corner <laughs> you're near in Seattle, oh, yeah. basically you can, you know, swing oh. a feline. And I know that you'll probably <laughs> get a lot of too. people <laughs> upset about that image, but mm -hmm. you know, it's like Seattle has a coffee culture, which rivals, many yeah. pizza cultures in the U S and, uh, I don't think people go to fist to cuff in the same way, but there have been close conversations that I've had with people that are like, you looking at my coffee, you know, well, it's like, like, <laughs> if, it's, if it's before work and there's a line out the door of the coffee oh. shop, fist to cuffs are possible. Yeah. But I used to, um, I used to think about that the, Let's just say that the average size Starbucks drink is a tall. Let's just say everyone yeah. got a tall, oh, which yes. seems laughable to me. Guys like a child size, but um, <laughs> a, a, a tall. And I think Starbucks, the the planning department, had analyzed that it takes the average person X number of steps to complete that drink. And we're going to put a store one step beyond that. So that, you know, if it's 150 steps, there'll be another Starbucks at 150, on the 151st. You will never have to run out of that coffee. Seattle cracks me up with the, the abundance of coffee that is available to you in, in King County. Let's just even say King County. You, you yeah. can't look at a, a, a block in the street and not find somebody selling coffee. That, and it's almost always good coffee. I, and I would say even Scott it goes, it borderlines, not just good coffee, but great coffee. I mean, right. I used to work for a company before I started Metamorphic Gear and they were East Coast. And I don't mm -hmm. want to harp on Dunkin' Donuts, but everyone does Dunkin'. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know why, because 
I mean, Seattle just has this, and I think it's one of the reasons Duncan has had such a hard time getting into the the economy here is because, you know, and you were talking about the line out the door for a particular barista or coffee right. store. And it's true. There are loyalties that you don't want to mess with around the coffee and people will line up, you know, before know. the store opens even, which is, I think, a whole podcast on its own, which is its own, yeah. really interesting to me because I'm like, I love my coffee but I don't love standing in line. And so I'll stand in line if it's maybe three to five minutes, but if it's anything longer than that, you can literally walk down the street to another coffee shop and get, mm -hmm. in my opinion, great coffee that right. fits the bill of right. helping you yeah. have a great Seattle day or Northwest day. <laughs> I'm just always interested in that and, uh, yeah, would love to hear more of the psychological aspect of what occurs for. I, you know, I total speculation on my part. This is one of the fun parts about doing having these conversations with yeah. people is almost everybody drinks coffee. I ask that question every now and then. Somebody goes, "I don't drink coffee," and then I, I that's when I disconnect. <laughs> I disconnect. But no, I mean, if they don't drink coffee, they, they're eh, that's okay. But most ninety percent of everybody's like you, and they're sharing. I go here and they're wherever here is, they say it in that emphatic way. I go here. Yeah. I get this and I will, this is what I want. Yeah. And I just, it's so amazing to me how passionate we can be about the local coffee shops that we frequent and support. Yeah. Um, and the truth of it is coffee clutch. I've never tried their coffee. I'm sure it's fine. I'm, yeah. I'm sure it's very good. I could go there and have a great cup of coffee. I could go across the street and have a great cup of coffee. I could go to, you know, insert brand here and have a great, yeah. and that's the nice thing about it. And so you go where you end up finding some form of community and connection. Like you like the barista they're, 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 yeah. they say hello and you, Hey, do you see the Mariners one last right. night? Or, well, they don't say that very often, but um, <laughs> Hey, yeah. do, do you know, do, 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 Hey, how you like the rain? Things like that. Um, the so sounders it, are always, coming back, you know, like, eight. right. So, yeah. yeah, I think, you know, they are uh, a form of community building. And I think yeah, that absolutely. Seattle and the Northwest loves community at various different levels. And so mm -hmm. we have our micro brews for, you know, yeah, all of the one. beer, which is later in the day, hopefully. And then we have the... <laughs> <laughs> that we have our morning ritual and community <laughs> building, which is very right. interesting. Well, and let we me ask really, you this. Yeah. Is, we'll, 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 I'll, we'll wind this one down with this. I have two questions for you. So the second to last question is late afternoon ritual. And you mentioned beer. Mm. Are you a beer drinker? Yes, I am a beer drinker. So w what is where, what is a beer, a local beer that you're finding that you think is like, this is really, I really like this beer. Um, I really love, uh, so recently, well, not recently, I've been drinking Fremont for a very long time. Uh, okay. and I used to live down in Ballard and Fremont in the Balfrida area. And I really enjoyed Red Hook, uh, mm -hmm. which I feel is kind of that mainstay, and, you know, it's a very large brand now, but, you know, back yeah. when it started, it was, you know, one of those really initially spectacular. Oh, was, I lived in Seattle when um, um, Ballard Bitter came out. Yeah, oh, sure, you betcha. Yeah. You know, and it was, it was, it was, yeah, at that time, Red Hook was, yeah, the signature Seattle beverage, you know, for beer. I kind of made the face that I did towards you when, you know, Budweiser bought them. So yes, they, they, that's the unfortunate thing. You know, that's the unfortunate thing that they're no longer a local to me, a local brand. Um, they still make fine, fine beverages, but yes, you know, and it happened. It, it happens. It happened to Boeing. It happened to, you know, it's like they no longer well, are Seattle brand really. I mean, when they moved nope. their headquarters back to Chicago. So it's right. You know, it's like, you know, I I bid them well, 
but I, I've yeah. definitely moved on. I, the beer that I've recently really started enjoying is uh, Urban Family Brewing. Oh, okay. Uh, they are producing just some of the most spectacular beers, uh, just high quality, uh, really flavorful. I, I love IPAs, but I also love Pilsners. Um, and you know, I, yeah, I just, and I, I, I've brewed myself in the past and with kids, I've not had that opportunity quite as much. And I really mm -hmm. enjoy, uh, the urban family brewing, okay. uh, and that's who I've been frequenting quite a bit. So my, my, I don't drink a lot of beer anymore because I literally woke up one day and it didn't like me anymore at all. I mean, I'd have one beer and felt like I had way too many. So I yeah. really stopped, but I, I like my beer. Like I like my coffee. So I want stouts. Stouts. I, I, I want the, the chewy you yeah. know, Guinness is a light beer to me. Okay. Type thing. So, so like the anyway. porters and yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Porters. But, but anyway. All right. So the last question I have is, is kind of the send off for you is, where can people find metamorphic gear? And why don't you let's end with that? Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you asked because one of the things that I really love doing in podcasts like this, and especially ones that are looking at kind of local talking local being kind of Northwest, greater Northwest is just the importance of people knowing about, brands that they want to support with their dollar because dollars really matter in the economy. Now you're voting essentially with what you want to see in the world and in the marketplace that you're frequenting. And so mm -hmm. I love getting, giving shout out. So one of our top stores is venue down in Ballard. They're an artist collective. Uh, they bring in, just spectacular local artists in the area that are uh, doing really interesting things. And one of the products that they have is our product line. Uh, and okay. we sell very well out of venue. Uh, all of our stores are also on our website. So if you want to look at a store locator, we have them there too. We have Boys Fort down in Portland, which sells a lot of our products. We also have a Seattle Made which is a nonprofit organization uh, that works with local manufacturers in the Seattle area specifically, but they've partnered with a organization or a company that now has a Seattle made store out at SeaTac airport. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we sell our products actually out at SeaTac also, uh, which is a fantastic exposure for us. And then absolutely. Uh, the other one is um, the waste management uh, ecology. Uh, we love working with them only because they really bring a super high focus to the importance of the recycling, repurposing kind of end of use and not using, you know, single use plastics as much in our life and trying to figure out ways in which we can lessen our impact on the environment. So we love working with Recology. That's outstanding. So we'll, we'll close with this. First off, thank you so much for making the time to do this on a Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday. Thank you. Uh, get that right this <laughs> third time. That's good. And yes. then <laughs> second of all, we'll put some links below so people can find your Instagram you. and, and your social media channels and all that online. And, yeah, I, I think what you guys are doing is, is fascinating and, and I think the products look awesome. And I, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, watching you guys as you continue to develop the company. So thank you for being on. Thank you for inviting us. And it really, I do immensely appreciate the invite because it takes getting into new communities and talking about what, a more, what Metamorphic Gear is doing specifically to let people know about us. Uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and let, a, let you know what's happening out there in the world. Well, thanks. Thank you for, like I said, thank you for making the yeah. time. So we'll, uh, we'll get this one, uh, out to the public here shortly. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Sorry. Scott. You bet.
Join us next time for another episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast.